most stubborn fellow was Percival Pate. He drank what he drank and he ate what he ate. But candies and pastries were all he thought good. Why his meals were the talk of the whole neighborhood. He scorned meat and vegetables. Such was his ilk that he reached for a soda instead of his milk. He much preferred frosting to wholesome fresh fruit. But don't get it wrong now, Purse was not acting cute. No, Purse's food habits could quickly be traced to his notion that food is eaten only for taste. So he ate what he liked, nothing else. Can you beat it? If it didn't taste sweet, why, Purse didn't eat it. Now, sugar makes energy, of that there's no doubt. But crowding out other foods? Hmm, better watch out. Yet, Percival Pate looked healthy enough. He was not pale and thin, and his skin wasn't rough. Still, his temper was bad, something he couldn't keep. And sometimes our Percival just couldn't sleep. One night in particular, Perce had the jitters. He just made a meal of two dozen jam fritters. Well, he rolled and he tossed and he tossed and he rolled. And his forehead felt hot and his stomach felt cold. His feet were as clammy as feet in the tomb. Something awful was happening to Percival's room. The walls all revolved at a dizzying pace and the ceiling went wiggling all over the place. Purse's poor fuddled brain grew numb and then number. But finally he dropped off into a light fitful slumber. The wall settled down without a collision. When out of the shadows appeared, well, a vision. At least it was like nothing Percival Pate had seen in his lifetime up to that date. It was staring at Percy, and from the set of its jaw, it didn't think much of whatever it saw. Well, sure, Purse felt frightened, but curious, too. He sat up in bed. Whoever are you? Why, I'm the one thing which could help your condition. Just call me Newt. <laughs> That's short for nutrition. Oh, yeah? You could help me? Said Purse, getting sore. Then how come I never have seen you before? Why, I never heard of you before all of this dizziness. Nutrition indeed. Don't give me that business. <laughs> nope. You never heard of me. That much is true. But I'm mighty important to growing boys like you. Ah, uh, how could you be important, hooted Purse in derision. I don't think there's any such thing as nutrition. You don't? Well, abracadabra, cadribble, cadrup. <laughs> there's a dictionary. Just look me up. L M N O N U T. Nu nutrition. Well, I'll be. Go on, Percival. What does it say? What is nutrition? Am I here to stay? Nutrition. All the processes which do include the way one takes in and uses his food. Oh, so what? So you're here on page 693. All of these big words mean nothing to me. Oh, but they should. They most certainly should. 
If you want a strong body and health that is good, you're headed for trouble and a puny condition. Unless you wake up and get wise to nutrition. Why, your food is the fuel that gives you your go. Food makes body repairs. <coughs> and uh, helps you to grow. And now you take carrots. If growing boys ate them... No, you take the carrots, said Percy. I hate them. Oh, dear, why do I get all of the jerks? If I'm going to help you, I'll have to give you the works. The works? Hey, wait a minute, Percival cried. Don't give me the works, Newt. I'll be on your side. <laughs> now, don't get excited. Don't blow up and burst. To give you the works just means uh, start from the first. And I can do that right here where I sit. Just shut your eyes, Percy. <laughs> This won't hurt a bit. So Purse shut his eyes and got in position, awaiting the works from this fellow nutrition. At first, there was nothing to cause him surprise, and then there was a rippling in front of his eyes. When he opened them up, Newt was nowhere in sight, but a series of pictures filled all the night and a voice that belonged to no particular being spoke out to tell Percival what he was seeing. Good food tastes good, as you'd think that it might, and good food has value in each healthful bite. Food helps us to grow. Food helps keep us warm. Food replaces cells which have met with some harm. Food gives us energy, supplies power and quickness. Food gives us resistance to tiredness and sickness. Food does all this work with the help every minute of parts known as elements hidden within it. Helps keep us warm. The foods which do that and also give energy, have carbohydrate and fat. I'll give you energy, like the voice said. You will find me in grain and potatoes and bread. And I'm also in sugar or anything sweet. To get carbohydrates, here's what you should eat. <laughs> I'm the one called fat, as you can see. These are the foods that have lots of me. Butter and cream, nuts and fat meat. I'll stick to your ribs and give you your heat. Helps us to grow. Some foods are most rich in something called protein, an element which serves as the building blocks for every corpuscle. I'm protein. I build all your tissue and muscle. I build your new cells and <laughs> then I turn right about and repair any cells which get old or wear out. Hey, you'll find me in good things to eat, such as these, milk, meat, fish and poultry, eggs, and yep, cheese. The foods which protect us from harm and disease contain minerals and vitamins. Let's look at these. Yeah, well, I'm calcium, and I belong in bones and teeth to make them strong. You'll find me in milk and cheese and food made from milk products. Yeah, sure, these are good. I'm phosphorus. That starts with a P. Sound teeth and bones are my specialty. I'll be happy to help you eat these foods and see. Remember, that's phosphorus. <laughs> Spelled with a P. When there's plenty of iron in the meals you are fed, your body makes blood cells 
dirty and red. Don't go around tired and pale as a sheet. These foods, having iron, are good things to eat. The vitamins are a numerous brood. They regulate how you use your food. Listen to what they have to say. How each one helps in a different way. I'm the one called vitamin A, who regulates growth. And by the way, I also help improve your sight, so that your eyes will see well at night. It's not hard to find me if you will look with care. If the foodstuff is yellow, you'll know I am there. I'm the one called vitamin B. Really, there's a family of me, including riboflavin and thiamine. And these are the foods that I am in. I prevent a disease called beriberi. I give you good nerves, help you grow, and be merry. I also increase a poor appetite. Be seeing you at your table tonight. Hello, you all. I'm vitamin C. These foods are rich in little old me. I think you'll like me. And anyway, you're going to need me every day. I may prevent sniffles. I banish scurvy. Get acquainted with me. You'll feel real vervy. Anyone for rickets? I thought not. Not with old vitamin D on the spot. I'll give you strong bones. I'll make you feel fine. I'm found in this bottle and also sunshine. Then the ripples came back and Percival Pate was back with nutrition <laughs> or something he ate. What was all that for, that lecture? Oh, brother, when you give me the works, you sound just like my mother. So food does have all of those things in to spike it. I'll still never eat it, because I just don't like it. Mm, now uh, you take your carrots, Newt once more began. Hey, can you see how a carrot fits into the plan? Why, a carrot has minerals, vitamin A, carbohydrates, and other things too, by the way. And if you eat all your carrots and lettuce and so on, you'll keep well and strong and have plenty to grow on. But now, if you don't, mm -mm, your health could be bad. When you don't eat your vegetables, life can be sad. Okay, you convinced me. I fall in defeat. I'll eat the carrots, but I still don't like meat. Oh, what a blockhead. You're missing the issue. You've got to have meat, too, to rebuild and grow tissue. Oh, I have to, have I? And I suppose I've got to have minerals and all of those. Precisely. Kazami! And now, what did I say? Oh, yes, you must have some of all these every day. One, vegetables, leafed and green. Two, eggs or meat that's good and lean. Three, citrus fruits or else tomatoes. Four, well, that's an easy one, potatoes. Five, Milk or cheese or good ice cream. Six, margarine, butter, cream. Seven, some bread, enriched, not plain, or any cereal that's whole grain. But uh, watch out for habits especially bad, 
like planning your diet according to fad. No one pill or food supplies all that you need. If you want to be healthy, you can't go to seed on something you like the first time you try it. Nope, you've got to eat a variety diet. Well, Percival, what do you say? Do you see any reason for a change in your way? Well, maybe I do, said Percival darkly. It might be the truth, and it might be malarkey. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it, if only to prove that there's just nothing to it. With that, old nutrition just faded away. Perce thought the whole thing was a dream next day. But he stuck by his promise and for a whole week ate just what Newt told him would keep him at peak. At the end of that time, did things start to improve? Well, Perce couldn't agree, but he couldn't disprove. So he tried it another week and one after that. And then his pet theories got knocked in a hat. For slowly, but surely, nope, there's no doubt, his muscles felt stronger, his body filled out. He began to feel better, tired less, and grew taller. His bouts with his temper grew fewer and smaller. By this time, his tastes had become educated. When Per saw the carrots now, he was elated. And as for the neighbors, well, they really buzzed at the difference in Percy that had been and was. Will you look at that boy? It's not hard to conclude that the way to be healthy is to eat the right food. something that happens by chance, without a good reason. And today, one of the committees from our class is going to show that accidents don't just happen. Exploring with Science with Mr. Robert Chemis. Accidents don't just happen. Now, the committee has chosen an unusual way to show this. They have made a series of drawings for us and they are going to make sound effects to go with them to show us what really happened. All right, Stevie. Go ahead. Thank you. As Mr. Chemist told you, we are going to show you that accidents don't just happen. We aren't only going to show you what happened. We are going to do a little detective work to prove our point. First, let's take a really good look at our accident. Yes, there it is. Tommy was riding his bike west on Market Street. Mr. Smith was driving his car south on 3rd Street. There was a traffic light at the corner. This light was the guardian of the corner. It tells us when to stop, when to go, when to be cautious, when to cross the street, or drive through an intersection. It was green for Mr. Smith. Everything was fine. Then... What happened? There was a bad accident between a bike and a car. The boy was thrown off. Very good. Now let's look at a few details. First, who hit who? Tommy hit the side of Mr. Smith's car. Who had the right of way? Mr. Smith. He had the green light. Then Tommy had the red light. Didn't he see it? I guess not, or he would have stopped. Do you have any idea why he didn't see the red light? I don't know. He looks all right. Couldn't there have been another cause for the accident? Something wrong with the bike? Let's take a closer look. Sure, the sprocket chain is broken. Yes, 
The pressure of putting on the brakes caused the chain to break. But what could have caused that? Putting on his brakes so suddenly. But that wouldn't have happened if the bike were in perfect condition. Then you think that if he had checked the bike before he rode it, he would have found out something was wrong and avoided the accident? It's possible. Yes, that's the first cause for accident. Mechanical failure. We talked to Tommy to see if we could get some more clues. This is what he said. Tommy, what were you doing at Third and Market? Well, it's not on my way home from school, but I always go that way at least once a week. You see, there's a showroom on the corner, and they always have a neat display of sports equipment. I kind of like to keep up on it. Were you looking at the window instead of where you were going? Not exactly. I just took a glance at it. Then I kind of saw the car, and that the light had changed. You mean you were looking at the window instead of where you were going. That's the second cause of the accident. Carelessness. Ah, oh, gee! That Mr. Smith should have... Never mind. Now let's look at this again. You were riding down Market Street. What time was it? After three. Four? Well, that's after three. Kind of late to be getting out of school, isn't it? So what? That's why I was in a hurry. I thought I'd be late serving my papers. Make a note of that. Let's see if we can find some more clues. Why was Tommy late leaving school? Take a look at this picture. All right. So I got my report card today with an F in math. I stayed late to see my math teacher. That adds up to a third cause of the accident. What was it? He was upset about his report card. Yes, he was upset. He wasn't thinking clearly. He felt sorry for himself. So he thought he'd give himself a treat and look at his favorite store window. Wayne, will you add the other two causes of the accident to our list? All right. Tom was careless and he was upset. But what about Mr. Smith? Did you question him? It certainly takes two to make an accident like this one. We certainly did. And this is what he had to say. Mr. Smith, what were you doing at Third and Market at that hour? Why, I was driving to the office. I'd been on a business trip. How was it that you were involved in the accident? Now look, it wasn't my fault. You saw what happened. I had a green light. I don't want any more of this nonsense. I'm tired. I've had quite a day. Well, that's the fourth cause to our accident. What is it? Mr. Smith wasn't being as careful as he should have either. Besides, he seems to get upset rather easily. So it's not an accident, as we usually put it. Both the people involved were tired. They were upset and careless. And besides, Tommy's brakes weren't working so well, so there was mechanical failure. Do you think there were any other causes for this accident? Well, maybe Tommy is somewhat spoiled and has too many toys. He really hasn't learned how to take care of them. Maybe the car wasn't in perfect condition. Or maybe the light was shining into Mr. Smith's eyes and he couldn't see Tommy coming toward him as he should. Anyway, we all agree that it takes a combination of things to cause an accident. And if we are careful, most accidents can be avoided. And that concludes our case, Mr. Chemis. That was very good. This committee, was, oh, has done a fine job of pointing out the basic principles which caused this accident. Mechanical failure is often involved in accidents. Being tired and upset might be involved too. Now, can you think of one word we might substitute for the way people act, or they think, or they feel? It should be a word that describes the way we do things. What about behavior, the way we behave? Very good. Behavior could describe the way we do things, and what we do is affected by the way we think and we feel. Let's substitute the word behavior for upset and careless. Behavior. Is it true that the way a person acts has to do with causing accidents? Yes, some people are, as we say, accident-prone. 
Have you ever noticed that some people seem to have many accidents? And it's not that they have bad luck, it's that they are, are upset easily. I still don't understand, Mr. Chalice. All right. Let's do some more detective work on some very simple accidents. Accidents which occur every day. Now, perhaps you have had these accidents yourself. Here is a jar of paint, just like the ones you use in art class. And the lid is stuck and you've been struggling to open the jar. Would you try to open it this way? Say, that fellow sure is angry that lid is stuck, isn't he? And look what happened. Would you say his feelings caused him to behave in such a way that he had an accident? Sure. And you agree. Now, could that accident have been avoided? What have you learned in science which could help you avoid such an accident? Now, look at the jar again. The lid is too tight. If it could be heated to expand, it would come off. Put it in hot water. Well, I think that's pretty good thinking. Had the first fellow who was trying to open the jar controlled his impatience and done some thinking, as you have, the accident would not have happened. Cuts are among the most frequent accidents that boys and girls have. Now, another kind of accident you have quite often is falling. Many, many falls are blamed on a very simple thing, like this. Is a cake of soap really to blame for a bad fall? I guess it's not the cake of soap, and it wouldn't be there if someone had put it where it belongs, in the soap. Any of you always put the soap in the soap dish? Let me see your hands. You uh, hesitated. Why did you hesitate? I had to stop and think about it. I just put the soap in the dish without thinking. Does anyone know a word that will describe things you do without thinking about them? It's a habit when you do something without thinking about it. And would you say there are good habits and poor habits? If someone leaves the soap on the floor or in the tub without thinking about it, is this a good or a poor habit? Poor habit. Poor habit. And do you agree that such a poor habit could cause an accident, a bad fall? Then let's add poor habits to our list of things that cause accidents. Poor habits. Now let me show you an example of a very poor habit which can result in another kind of accident which boys and girls often have. And see if you can tell me what the poor habit is. the cover on those matches, Mr. Chemis. Yes, a poor habit. One so simple as not closing the cover on a pack of matches can cause a, a painful accident. Can it be avoided? Hmm? Sure. Can it? You, you can change good ha bad habits to good habits. Very good. good. How many of these things can be changed to avoid an accident? What about mechanical failure? If we check, we should check anything we are using first to make sure it is in good condition. We could avoid accidents that way. What about behavior? Stop and think first and not let our feelings make us careless or impatient. This could help us to prevent accidents. Your behavior is important. Almost every accident can be prevented by learning to understand yourself and figuring out what is the best way to act which could be quite different from the way you feel like acting. Now, what about poor habits? We can change poor habits to good habits, safe habits. Mm. Now, you have been excellent detectives today. You have discovered why accidents occur, and you know now that accidents don't just happen. You have also discovered how accidents can be prevented. Why don't you continue your detective work and figure out what causes accidents? The artists in your class might draw some accident problems for you to, to investigate. And you might even find accounts of accidents in the newspapers and decide how the accident might have been prevented. For instance, 
Here is the report of an accident. As you listen, decide really or what really caused it to happen and what might have prevented the accident. James Brown, age 10, was sure that he could build a rocket that would really work. He promised his pals that he would launch his rocket in one week. James' parents were unaware of the fact that he was staying up until 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning planning and building his rocket. And about midnight on the final day, James added the last chemicals to his rocket fuel. There was a terrific explosion. And later when he was questioned, James said he couldn't remember what mistake he had made. Exploring with science is produced the best looking one in the block. Come on, Dad. Well, how about a glass of milk with that? No, not now. Down here in the basement workshop where his father used to work, using the tools he used to use, Bo feels very close to his father. Here he labors over that certain something that now occupies his every spare moment, the soapbox derby racer, which he hopes will win him one of the valuable college scholarships he will need to help him finish his education. There are lots of big prizes. And Bo never forgets what his father used to tell him. Whatever else you do, son, get an education. A man just doesn't have much of a chance these days without one. Bo built a racer once before. It wasn't much of a success. He got beat in the first heat. That's his father. And that's his father's hockey medal. Bo hung it up over the workbench. Just for luck. Back in Minot, Dalton Deerdorf is making some progress, too. At the Johnson Chevrolet dealership, which co-sponsors the Soapbox Derby there, Mr. Deerdorf signs Dalton up as an entrant, and Dalton goes on his way, the proud possessor of his Soapbox Derby kit. The kit contains the official derby wheels and axles he will need to build his racer. He reads the instructions carefully, memorizing the rules he must follow. Then, Dalton designs his racing car by studying pictures of winning racers from years past. Full weight, minimum cross-section, maximum car and wheelbase length, best streamlining. There are the factors that make a winning car. I think that will cover general construction fairly well. In special soapbox derby clinics all over the country, future champions are learning the fine points of building a racer. As each boy learns for himself, any boy can build a racer. All he has to do is want to, badly enough. There are many ways of building the body shell. Dalton makes his of plywood. Some other boys make theirs of fiberglass, which they mold over forms made of wire screen. Bo also uses plywood for the sides. 
Bo breaks a lot of fine old traditions in building his racer. For one thing, he uses plenty of nails in some places instead of screws. Bo's method of keeping track of the weight so that he doesn't go over the limit is nothing short of ingenious. With his racer straddled over two barrels, he crouches beneath it on his bathroom scale and manages to lift it just long enough to get a reading. 210 pounds, allowing 30 pounds for the wheels, which are yet to be installed, that's a total of 240 pounds. Okay now, but it's getting pretty close to that 250 pound limit. With varying grades of sandpaper, Dalton polishes the plywood shell to a smooth surface before painting. From Alaska to Florida, Hawaii to Maine, and in Canada, Okinawa, the Philippines, West Germany, and Venezuela, in 239 cities, Derby Day is the day when each community stages its own local races to decide the lucky boy who will go on to Akron and represent his hometown in the All-American. Hundreds of hours of effort by countless Derby workers go into these local derbies to make each one an event the boys and their parents will never forget. And when Derby Day is over, the 239 local champions, which includes Dalton Deerdorf in Minot and Bo Conrad in Duluth, now head for Akron and the famous All-American. Akpile. No other city in the world is more ready and willing to stand itself on its ear for a bunch of boys that it likes than Akron for the Soapbox Derby. No king, prince, or prime minister ever got a wilder, more enthusiastic welcome than a derby champ in Akron. This is the day when the kids are kings and the grown-ups stand and cheer. After their tumultuous welcome to Akron, the champs are guests at Derby Town, one of the finest boys' camps in America. Four unforgettable days packed from dawn till bedtime with every kind of fun, game, and sport. Television's lawman, John Russell, is there to give autographs. So is singing star Paul Anka, screen star Rock Hudson, and comedian Paul Lynn. All in all, everyone has a wonderful time. Pre-race days at Derby Downs are filled with activity. A thousand and one things to get done and very little time left to do it in. New wheels issued for the race have to be broken in. Last minute repairs and adjustments have to be made. Finishes that already gleam like that on a piano have to be gone over yet again with wax and polish cloth. 239 cars, each one the pride and joy of the boy who built it, must be weighed and inspected. Every champion since the first Soapbox Derby in 1934 has gone on to outstanding success in his later life. Maurice Bale, 1935, now an engineer with motors at Muncie, Indiana. Herbert Munch, 1936, owner of his own business in Hood River, Oregon. On and on the list goes. Yes, there's something about these soapbox derby boys. You might even say, once a winner, 
always a winner. Bo would like to be one of them, but as he looks over the competition, his hopes dim. Just look at all those cars. It really shakes you up to see how beautifully built most of them are. To Bo, every one of those other cars seems to look better than his. With inspection behind them, each boy gets a trial run down the green top track that has led so many others to fame and fortune. Friday night, there's a big gathering around the campfire at Derby Town with a nice gift for every boy, a watch, to remind him of the hours he spent at Derby Town. Tomorrow is the day of the big race, and who can sleep tonight? Whatever else you do, son, get an education. A man just doesn't have much of a chance these days without one. And suddenly, it's Derby Day. Beneath alternating gray and blue skies, Derby Downs is a sea of color. The stands packed with excited fans and anxious moms and pops, while 3,500 mark old a seventh grader. Hey, Bo. Hey, Bo, we need a picture tonight. How about you? No, not tonight. I've got to get home. I've got work to do. Gosh, you've said that every night. What are you working on that's so important? Yes, Dalton, the next All-American champion could be you. It could be any boy like you, between the ages of 11 and 15 years, with the courage and determination to try. Ordeen Junior High School in Duluth, Minnesota. Classes are out for the day, and the boys and girls are starting home. Among them is a boy we'll be watching from now on. His name is Harold Willis Conrad. But most people call him Bo. He's 12 years to make the Derby Day Parade an eye-filling spectacle. Passes you both to the stand, far off the track there. You'll want to give a hand to the 1963 champion, 239, so hard to be champion. From the United States, Canada, Venezuela, West Germany, Hawaii, Okinawa, the Philippines. Each carries his own champion fire. The grown-ups, Arthur Godfrey, John Russell. Look at this racer. Yeah. Yeah, she looks like fun. Bring one of your parents and sign up now for the 1963 Soapbox Derby, the greatest amateur racing event in the world. You build your own derby racer like this one, Race it in the local derby, and if you win, you get to compete in the famous All-American Soapbox Derby in Akron. Next off, Paul Anka, get things off to a flying start with a traditional oil can derby. It's done. Here they come, Wayne 1, John Russell, Wayne 2, Hudson Patsy, Wayne 3, Paul Anka. Michael Patsy, Hudson Patsy, Wayne 1, John Russell, Wayne 2, Hudson Patsy, Wayne 3, Paul seconds to run it. 30 seconds that can seem like a lifetime. In wave after wave, the cars go whizzing down the hill. As soon as the track can be cleared, three more go down. Four more. Yeah, well, you better watch it because it's the bottom of the hill is a pretty tricky win. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, good luck. 28.20. Even a downpour of rain fails to dampen the spirits of the fans 
and only briefly delays the race. A two-car heat coming up, heat 80, and lane one will be Dalton Deirdre of Minot, South Dakota. In lane three, Corwin Habermans of Baldwin, Missouri, and here they come. And now, Dalton, this is it. The next 30 seconds heat will tell the tale. Two-car heat. At the halfway point, Minot, South Dakota, Dalton Deirdre appears in the lead. Now the lead changes hands, coming into the stretch in lane three, Corwin Habermans. Baldwin, Missouri, and he's gaining on lane one as he crosses the finish line. The winner, Corwin Haberman, the ball of the floor, the winner. And the time is 28.91, 28.91. Dalton now joins the other champs in the rooting section to cheer the new winners. And the race goes on. That's the set. her doll. One day, not very long ago, Jean was playing with her doll. But what do you think Frank was doing? Here is Frank now. What is he up to? What does he see? Why is he hiding? Uh oh he is hiding from his sister Jean. Why doesn't he want Jean to see him? Jean doesn't see him. She is busy with her doll clothes. She leaves them to dry in the sun. Jean tells Nancy Jane, her favorite doll, to be good. Jean is all dressed up, for she is expecting a visitor. Betty, her friend, will come very soon. She must get ready. But here is Frank again. Why is he running? Oh, he sees Betty coming. Betty and her doll Beatrice. Jean welcomes her friend Betty. She thinks Beatrice, Betty's doll, would like to play with Nancy Jane. But who is this running behind the tree? Why, it's Frank again. Why is he listening so closely? He hears Betty say, Beatrice burned her finger yesterday. I have been worried about my dolly too, says Jean. Do you see any red spots on her? I think she's getting measles. Measles? Red spots, says Frank. That gives me an idea. Oh, but look. Nancy Jane is sleepy. It's time for her nap, Jean says. But first, she must have her milk. Beatrice is sleepy, too. A bottle of milk for Beatrice. A bottle of milk for Nancy Jane. And so to bed for a nice afternoon nap in the warm sunshine. Nancy Jane and Beatrice, side by side, tuck safely in bed for a nice long afternoon nap. And now Jean and Betty will have a quiet lunch together. Do you take cream in your tea, asks Jean. Oh, yes, thank you, Betty answers. It's very good. And you? No, I take lemon, Jean replies. And so Jean and her friend Betty are having a quiet lunch together while their dollies sleep. But there is Frank again. Where is he going? He is over by the doll. Why is he smiling to himself? What does he have? He has a box of crayons. He takes out the red crayon. Now what is he doing? Oh, look, he is making red marks on Nancy Jane's face. Jean, look. Look at what Frank is doing. But Jean doesn't see him. Red marks, the measles. Frank has given Nancy Jane the measles. Look, Jean, before Frank goes away. But Jean doesn't see him. Poor Nancy Jane. She really has the measles now. But when will Jean see what Frank has done? Will Jean see now? Look, Jean. Look at Dolly's face. 
And she does. Nancy, Jane, what has happened to you? You really caught the measles. What shall I do, asks Jean. I'll call Mother. Mother, come here, please. But who is that behind the fence? Yes, it's Frank. Look, Mother, says Jean, Nancy Jane has the measles. Measles? Hmm, I tell Jean. Someone has painted the measles on Nancy Jane's face, and there he is. It's Frank. He looks for a place to hide. Not in here, Frank. After him, Betty. After him, Jean. Here he comes, right through the clothes on the line. Here he comes again. What fun, what fun everyone is having. But where is Frank now? Where is he hiding? There is a shadow. After him. After him, everyone. But we can't find him. Where is he? There he is. There is Frank's shadow. Now we have him at last. I give up, I give up, Frank says. You'd better, I tell Frank, for you have work to do. You gave Nancy Jane the measles. Now you have to get her over them. That's fair, isn't it? And just see that you get every spot off. Jean and Betty, come with me. I give Jean a piece of paper and a crayon, a red crayon. She begins to write something. Frank wants to know what is going on, too. But you just get back to work, Frank. You'll know in just a minute. There, Jean is all finished. What does she have? It's a sign. It says, measles, keep out. Everyone laughs and Frank joins in. What a lot of fun it has been. The boys and girls in this schoolyard are waiting for the first bell. This is Wendy Webb. This is her twin brother, Jamie. There's the bell. Let's go with them to their classroom. Good morning, Miss Jones. Good morning. Miss Jones is the teacher. The children are very fond of her. And Miss Jones likes each of the pupils. This is a day like any other day in class. Spelling. Arithmetic. Reading. Music. And finally, it is almost time for the dismissal bell. Before the children are dismissed for the day, Miss Jones suggests that they review the safety rules they discussed yesterday. The four rules are... Don't accept gifts from strangers. How many of you can tell us why? The children know how important it is to remember these safety rules. Don't accept rides from strangers. Do you remember the important reasons for this? Don't walk through dark or lonely streets. 
Who can tell us why? The children realize that safe behavior is just as important as spelling and arithmetic. Remember, the policeman is always your friend. What are some of the ways in which he can help you? And so this school day comes to a close. Some children remain after school to play. Others are picked up by their parents or carpools. There are those who ride their bikes home. And some walk home. Wendy and Jamie live just a few blocks from the school. Unless the weather is bad, they walk to and from school every day. Sometimes there are interesting things to do or see on the way home from school. All children love puppies. Grown-ups know this and will usually let them pet or play with a puppy. They may even offer to give it to the children as a gift. Don't accept gifts from strangers. It is the next day. Wendy and Jamie are on their way to school and they have occasion to remember another one of the safety rules. A lady in a beautiful car says she is going past the school and will be glad to give them a ride. Don't accept rides from strangers. Today is Saturday. Wendy and Jamie help their mother with the household chores. After lunch, they are free to go to the park for the afternoon. Their mother reminds them to be sure to be home before dark. Parks and playgrounds are fun. There is so much to do. And because there is so much to do, we sometimes forget how quickly the time passes. Yes, Wendy and Jamie realize they have been gone longer than they should have. They know their mother will worry if they are not home on time. And Wendy and Jamie do not want to upset their mother. Wait a minute, Jamie knows a shortcut. If they go down this street, they can save time. Don't walk through dark or lonely streets. That's right, children. Stay on the main street. Remember, the policeman is always your friend.
Wendy and Jamie have learned the safety rules. We hope you have too. Have you ever noticed that people walk in the streets like the alphabet? They do, you know. And that goes for grown-ups and children alike. I'm sure you know one of the alphabet walkers, the most common one, the J walker. He crosses the street anywhere he likes. In the middle of the block, he just walks into the traffic. The dictionary says that a jaywalker is someone who crosses the street carelessly without obeying the traffic regulations so that he is endangered by the traffic. And you know what a jay is? Well, besides being a bird, it also means a silly person. And that is just what the jitter-brained jaywalker is. Don't jaywalk. Always use a marked crosswalk or go to a street corner. Best of all, one with a traffic signal. Then wait until the light changes to green and carefully cross the street with the green light, always watching for cars that may be turning into your street. If you remember the rules and regulations of walking correctly in the street, and if you obey them at all times, you'll get an A in walking wisely. So don't be a jaywalker, be an A walker. But the jaywalker isn't the only kind of pedestrian who doesn't know how to walk in the street. Have you ever seen the G-walker? He is always gawking at something. Gee, he says, look at that, and that, and that. Gee. Goggle-eyed, the G-walker gazes at all sorts of things, and he doesn't look where he's going. Too busy gawking at other things, the only thing he isn't looking at is the traffic. The only things he doesn't observe are the traffic rules. Always watch where you're going. Be alert and careful when you walk in the streets. You don't want to be a goggle-eyed G-walker. Be an A-walker, like Bill and Betty. Besides being A-walkers, they're also C-walkers. See how they walk in a street that has no sidewalk? They walk all the way at the edge of the road in single file and on the left side against the traffic so that they can see the cars coming, and the cars can see them. Bill and Betty are real sea walkers, for they can see all the traffic all the time and get out of the way if they have to. Always remember to walk against the traffic if you have to walk on a road that has no sidewalk, so that you can see the cars coming. And there are lots of other alphabet walkers floating about in the streets like letters in a bowl of alphabet soup or cereal. This boy is an eye walker. He thinks that as long as he crosses the street at a street corner, he need only think of himself. Here I come as the eye walker. I am going to cross the street. And he steps off the right in front of the traffic. The eye walker is inconsiderate and he takes a big and dangerous risk. For one day, the car may not be able to stop in time. Always look carefully both to the left and to the right and to the left again, even though you do cross the street at an intersection as you should. Show consideration for the drivers and be safe yourself. Don't ever behave like the ill-mannered eye walker. And the inconsiderate eye walker has a cousin, the K walker. You remember the legend of King Arthur in his Knights of the Round Table. There was the gallant Sir Lancelot and the courteous and considerate Sir Galahad. But there was also a knight who was nothing but a boastful show-off, Sir Kay. And that's just what the Kay Walker is, too. A conceited, cocksure clown. The street is no place for the carnival capers of the K-Walker. 
If you want to do tricks or play games, there are lots of places where it's much more fun to do them. Sometimes the K-walker jumps about like a kangaroo, throwing caution to the winds, trying to show off. It's only luck that he doesn't get hurt. And that's why smart boys and girls don't clown in the street and behave like the cocksure K-walker. Or like the open-mouthed O-walker. The O-walker hasn't learned how to obey the rules for walking wisely and correctly in the streets, and sometimes he'll act like a real oaf. Oh! One of the worst things anyone can do is run out into the street from between parked cars. The old walker doesn't think before he acts. Oh, says the old walker, I forgot. And there he is, the open-mouthed old walker, ready to be bowled over. But it really isn't hard to remember that you should stay on the sidewalk, except when you have to cross the street. And we know now how that is done, don't we? Towards the end of the alphabet, we find another wild letter walker. I'm sure you all know him, the Y walker. He's a real wiseacre. Why, says the Y walker, why walk when you can hitch a ride? Why, indeed. Why, you don't know anything about the motorist who might pick you up. You don't know what kind of a person he might be. He could be a very bad driver, for instance, and you could have a serious accident. Hitchhiking can be dangerous, so don't hitch rides with strangers. On your way home from school, always walk the same safe route, the one your parents know and have told you to take. I'm sure you don't want to wind up in trouble. So don't be a wiseacre why walker. You see, in order to walk safely and wisely in the streets, you'll have to mind your P's and Q's. And if you want to be an alphabet walker, be an A walker, the first letter of the alphabet. Or you might end up as one of the last letters, the letter X, where X marks the spot over an X pedestrian. You too can get an A in walking wisely, like Bill and Betty. It's as easy as ABC. Just remember not to walk like these alphabet walkers, the jitterbrain J walker, who always gets into jams. Remember always to cross the street at a marked crosswalk or at a street corner with the green light. And here's the goggle-eyed G-walker, who doesn't look where he's going. Instead of making sure he always can see the traffic and that the traffic can see him. And the ill-mannered I-walker, who takes a dangerous risk by thinking only of himself instead of showing consideration for the drivers. And instead of looking to the left, and to the right, and to the left again, before crossing a street, as he should. And the cocksure K-walker, the show-off, who clowns around and does silly tricks in the street. When he could have much more fun in the playground with his friends. And don't forget the open-mouthed O-walker who, like a real oaf, doesn't think before he acts, but is so surprised when he gets into trouble. And the wiseacre why walker, who foolishly says, why walk when you can hitch a ride? All those alphabet walkers still have to learn how to walk wisely. like Bill and Betty, and you can learn from them. Be a letter-perfect pedestrian. Don't be a jaywalker. Be an A-walker.
Say, she bred and sent them on their way. She knew they'd go straight there and back, and off they went, the cautious twins. They knew rules to heed. No matter what was for them, they'd not give in. Most people love a little child. Some grown-ups, though, are bad. The bad ones look like good ones, like any mom or dad. So that is why you must not talk to strangers that you meet. Don't let them give you any toys or anything to eat. If someone that you do not know should offer you a treat, Remember how he looks and talks, but run fast up the street. Upon returning from the store, their friends were at the gate. They asked them to the park to play. The twins thought that was great. They'd asked their mother anxiously. They'd really like to go. She told them, yes, be back at noon. You must be prompt, you know. It's wonderful to play with friends, to run and swing and climb, to slide and yell, and all the while remembering the time. When to the restroom you must go at playground, parks, or zoo, be sure to ask a cautious friend to come along with you. Don't stray away from all your friends toward bushes or the trees. Stay near the crowds, the slide, the swings, and Mother will be pleased. It's time to go. Doreen and Dan start home along the street, each watching cars and signals, too. They hurry home to eat. Along the way, a stranger waves just off the avenue. The twins remember mother's words. They don't forget. Would you? A person may invite you to a house, garage, or shed. Say no to him and run and tell your mother what he said. Doreen and Dan, the cautious twins, run home as good kids do. For home's the very safest place when danger threatens you. Back home at noon, right smack on time. The twins are hungry, say. But better yet, they get to go to the local matinee. Their mother says it's their reward for doing what she asks, remembering rules and helping her with little household tasks. Doreen and Dan are young for shows, that is, to go alone, so Sister Joan will go with them, a sort of chaperone. It's fun to see a movie show with pirates, Indians, kings, but shows are always pretty dark, and bad people may try bad things. So when you go to see a show, if someone touches you, get up and move away from there and tell the usher to. Don't let a stranger pat your hand or straighten up your clothes. Good strangers let a child alone, as everybody knows. And when they left the show for homes of Joan, although then told the twins to go home alone. Doreen and Dan walked on their way. They promised not to roam. A man walked up to them and said, he'd come to take them home. If someone tells you he was sent to take you home to Dad, skedaddle away as fast as you can. Perhaps that man is bad. Don't go away with him at all, although he asks you to. If he should grab you, scream so loud that help will come to you. Now that was close, too close for sure. That really was a fright. They had to hurry on their way, for it was almost night. A car drove up, and in it was the cutest puppy dog. The man said, come and see my pet. And Dan was all agog. Doreen recalled the rule for this. Then Dan remembered too. If you should see a dog like this, would you remember too? If someone in a motor car should offer you a ride, scream loudly as you run away, but do not get inside. If you can read the license plate, repeat it in your mind, or write it down upon the ground with anything you find. But look where this had left the twins. The alley looked real great. Should they go through and get home fast? It's growing dark and late. But mother's words came to their mind. And though they'd like to go, they knew that this was time to stop. The best time to say no. It's never safe in alleys or empty buildings. To Here they are. All Five fingers make a hand, a hand that says, stop. Remember the five points of how to protect your bike. This is
his day, he's stopping by the grocery store on his brand new bike. The first really important thing he's ever owned. Hey, Dave, hold it. Aren't you forgetting something? How about the chain and lock? Is your bike safe out there like that? Let's do it again. That's it. That's it, Dave. But little does Dave know that sitting at that very corner is Creepo the Thief, the worst bike thief in 50 states. Creepo has a hunger for bikes, and he's smart. Will he get Dave's bike? Let's see. What's this? Locked! Yeah, Creepo thought he had that one, but it was locked to the bike rack. Curses! Foiled! But maybe some sucker will come along and leave his bike without locking it. Here's Goofer. He's always in a rush. He doesn't have time to worry about the little things like locking his bike. <laughs> hey, Creepo, maybe Goofer is the sucker you've been waiting for. Looks like his bike is just asking to be taken. <laughs> Here comes Goofer. Surprise, Goofer. Your bike is gone. Oh, my bike is gone. One, lock your bike, or it can disappear in a flash, as Goofer found out. This is Kathy. She needs a good place to park her bike. The alley is too dark and quiet. Even though there's no bike rack where she's going, at least she can lock it where she can keep an eye on it, from inside, where there are people going by who would see anyone fooling around with a locked bike. It's a good thing she did, because little did she know that Creepo the Thief was at that very place and looking things over. Here's Dilly. She doesn't dally up the alley. That's fine with her. Does she lock her bike? Sure, she locks her bike. Little does she know that Creepo just loves quiet places like alleys. And it's easy to just pick up Dilly's bike, lock, chain and all, and put it into his handy little van. <laughs> Surprise, Dilly! <laughs> Point two. Lock your bike in as safe a place as you can find. Dilly didn't. There's a right chain and a wrong chain for any job. Like a dog chain. That's the right chain for Dave's dog, but it's not the one he's using on his bike. For that job, he got the best chain and lock he could find. His dad told him not to try to save a few dollars on a chain and lock and wind up losing his bike. But little does Dave know that through a clever hole in the newspaper, Creepo has observed the whole scene. And he brought his bolt cutter this time. It should do the trick, unless, unless Dave's chain and lock are tough enough. <laughs> Creepo has another cutter up his sleeve. Well, not exactly up his sleeve, but anyway, it looks like this would cut through anything. Nope. 
Dave had the right chain and lock. Creepo will just have to wait for some sucker. Maybe this is the sucker Creepo is waiting for. Look at that flimsy chain and padlock. The same one he uses for his dog. Well, that was sure easy. And Creepo was so happy to get the bike that he forgot his cutters. Surprise, Goofer! Too bad. He didn't follow point three. To use a good chain and lock. A smart person always remembers. To lock your bike in a wise location with the best chain and lock you can get. <laughs> Kathy sure takes good care of her bike. She locks it to something good and solid, like the post on her front porch. Notice how she carefully puts the chain through the front wheel, then around the post, and through the rear wheel and the triangle of the bike frame. A tree is also a good thing for locking a bike, and if one chain isn't long enough, you can use two locks and two chains end to end. Or, if you have one chain, you can loop and lock around the front wheel and frame. And around the back wheel and frame. One in the front and one in the back. Well, here's Billy. She's dizzy and in a tizzy. She doesn't bother to chain through the frame. She just chains the front wheel. But little does Dilly know that Creepo just happens to be in the neighborhood. Will he get Kathy's bike? No way. How about that other bike? Creepo has special tools for a job like this. Creepo has his handy wrench, unscrews two nuts, and there goes her frame and back wheel. All Creepo has to do is get a front wheel somewhere, and he's got himself another bike. No surprise for Kathy. She took care of point four. She chained her bike properly. But Creepo is really smart, and just in case something goes wrong, there's one thing else to do. Most bikes have a serial number stamped into the bike frame. This number would be given to the local police department for registration in their files, and at least one copy kept at home in a safe place. If your bike has no serial number, or even if it has one, it's possible to put a personal, secret type of identification mark on parts of the bike. You can get an electric needle or metal marking pen in most hobby shops. In some towns, a bike is supposed to have a license plate. All these things are so that the police can help you get your bike back. Jeff and Tom had seen this fellow around a few times before their bikes were missing. So they told their friend the policeman when they saw Creepo up the alley with his van. Jeff says that's his bike and the registration number is on the frame. Just to prove it, he shows his copy of the serial number burned into the tag on his keychain. But the policeman can't find it. It's been filed off. But Jeff says, look there for my secret mark. Aha! It's there, all right. Now the policeman wants to see the bike that's in the van. Tom says, he carries a copy of his license number in his wallet. See how it matches to the license number on the bike? Creepo just remembered he had something to do somewhere else.
So these boys took care of the fifth point. They had all the registered evidence that they were their bikes. Creepo lost the game. Maybe some new invention will be out soon that'll take care of any bicycle thief. Some kind of secret alarm. But for right now, stop. Protect your bike. Remember and practice the five good habits of keeping your bike. Lock your bike in a wise location with a good chain and lock chained around something strong and through both wheels and frame and registered in every way you can can remind you how to protect your bike your bike No matter in what strange disguise, it's in the hair that beauty lies. So let's start where it must begin, in a follicle, in the skin. The skin has two layers, the dermis or true skin, and the hard, thin outer surface or epidermis. Extending from the surface of the skin through to the base of the dermis is the follicle, the living sheath in which the hair is formed. The average length of a follicle is only about an eighth of an inch. On an average head, there will be about a hundred thousand of them. So the follicles are among the most numerous organs of the skin, along with the sweat glands, the nerves, the blood vessels, and the fatty tissue. Let's look more closely at a follicle and see how the actual hair originates. At the base of the follicle is a tiny group of blood vessels called the papilla. The papilla supplies energy to a cone of multiplying cells called the matrix. These cells multiply rapidly, moving up the follicle as their numbers increase. At this stage, they are still quite soft and can be squeezed by the follicle walls into longer spindle-like shapes. Then they harden into a dead, plastic-like material called keratin. This is hair. Hair has three main layers. The outer layer is the cuticle, the cells of which have been flattened into scales against the side of the follicle. The next layer is the cortex. This is formed from the long, spindle-shaped cells. The third layer, the core of the hair, is the medulla, which is soft and spongy, usually containing some pockets of air. Hair, then, is a part of the skin. And, as well as the follicle, there are two other organs of the skin which affect it. One is the hair muscle, though with human beings, these muscles can usually produce nothing more violent than goose pimples. The muscles are small and weak, but when contracting as a reaction to cold or fright, they can pucker the skin into a goose pimple and possibly even pull the hair upright. Near to the muscle at the top of the follicle, 
is the second organ of the skin to affect the hair, the sebaceous gland. These glands pump sebum out into the follicle and onto the scalp. Sebum gives hair its natural grease. It also tends to collect dirt, but regular shampooing will help clean away the old sebum and so let fresh sebum spread easily over the scalp. Brushing helps here too. Don't be alarmed if brushing dislodges some loose hairs. Every day, some 50 of the hairs of your head will die. For every hair has its own life cycle. It grows for a certain time and then falls out. Now let's take up the life cycle inside the follicle with the birth of a new hair. It will grow for anything up to six years at a rate of half an inch per month. At the end of that time, it will die. Its death begins in the matrix, which simply stops producing new cells. When this happens, the bulb of the hair degenerates and the follicle itself contracts, pushing the hair upwards before it. About six months after the degeneration of the bulb, the hair will be brushed away. If the follicle fails to start a new cycle, becomes dormant, and it can happen, baldness is the eventual result. So far, no one knows why, and nothing can be done about it. But normally, within only a few hours, a new hair will be born and the cycle begins again. Uncut, hair would probably grow to a length of about three feet, but in fact, its length can vary greatly from head to head. If left to grow, it's quite possible that men's hair would be as long as women's. Hair varies in thickness. Some hair is only one fifteen hundredth of an inch thick. Other hair is ten times this thickness. However thin, hair has a surprising tensile strength even greater than a copper wire of equal thickness. Hair varies in texture. Some is smooth and supple. Other is brittle and dry. One reason for such differences lies in the sebaceous glands and the sebum. With too little sebum, the hair will be poorly lubricated and have less than its proper luster. The scalp is likely to be covered with loose, dry dandruff. Or there may be too much sebum. Then the hair will become lank and greasy. The scalp a breeding ground for bacteria. This helps to cause greasy dandruff. But remember that no matter how much sebum is present, brushing will distribute it best. Hair varies in curliness. A straight follicle produces straight hair, a curved follicle curved hair. If the follicle is bent at the point where the hair hardens, the hair will be set into a curly shape. Waves and curls can be made artificially, but you can't alter the shape of the follicle. So inevitably, artificial waves grow out. What artificial waving does is to break down the molecular structure of the keratin. The atoms of a keratin molecule are formed together like a spiral spring. And the elasticity of keratin is due to the ability of this spring to uncoil. Branch links join the main chains. Strong heat can temporarily break these branch links. Now, curl the hair. On cooling, the branch links will reform and hold the hair in the new wave. But heat isn't essential to artificial waving. Cold, chemical processes can have just the same effect. Hair varies in color. 
natural colour is given to a hair at its birth. The natural colouring of our hair can change, of course. Frequently does in childhood, moreover. In the matrix are cells called melanocytes. They produce small grains of coloured matter called melanin, which are injected into the hair cells before they move up the follicle. This colour is in fact concentrated in the second layer, the cortex, but it's seen through the outer layer, the cuticle, which is transparent. Melanin has a wide range of colour and several colours may be represented within any one head. Several different colours can even be represented within one hair. If the melanocytes stop producing colour, the hair will go white. But believe it or not, there is no such thing as a grey hair. It is only the combination of white and coloured hairs which gives a grey effect. Of course, hair can be dyed or bleached, but again, this cannot be a permanent change. Take bleaching. First of all, water must soak into the hair and swell it. The bleaching agent can now penetrate the cuticle. It reaches the cortex, where the colour is concentrated, and the natural colour is bleached out. Remove the water, leave the hair to dry, and the new colour will then be seen through the transparent cuticle. All hair which grows after bleaching will have the natural colour. Even after a month, you can see this. Dyeing hair shows similar results. Essentially, these processes don't last. Whatever we do to our hair, it continues to lead very much a life of its own. Yet never throughout history have we ceased trying to improve on nature. Sphinx-like Egyptian, Classical Greek, opulent Byzantine. And then, through history, to the even more fantastic. Yet, despite all our efforts, nothing attracts as much as a natural, well-groomed head of hair. Deep in the dermis, the hair, a part of the skin, is born in the follicle. Fed by the papilla, it's formed from the cells of the matrix, keratinized in the bulb, possibly set into a curve, a natural wave, coloured by melanin, lubricated by the sebaceous glands. Finally, it emerges onto your scalp, along with the other 100,000 hairs you ought to have. All you have to do to look after it is to wash it and brush it.